This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's oral history program, Living Legends Collection. This interview was originally conducted on February the 25th, 1965. The interview was conducted by Mr. Frank Doyle. The interviewee is Mr. Roy P. Stewart, that's S-T-E-W-A-R-T, of Oklahoma City. This interview is being re-recorded on June the 7th, 1985, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the oral history program by Judith Michener. This is the uh, 25th, isn't it? 25th. 25th of February in 1965. Uh, the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, we sat around the smoking room in this uh, new emporium. We got on the bus and had a nice discussion with uh, RGM. I guess more people know him by RGM than anything else. He's been around a long time. He sure has, and we wanted to uh, spend this time talking with uh, Roy Stewart. And Roy, naturally, your name is uh, well known, and the products of your name and your efforts and talents, the Oklahoman and Times. Let's start by finding out where you came from. I came from Tennessee. I was born in Tennessee, right outside Nashville, a little town called Donaldson, mm -hmm. just opposite the Hermitage. My father was a, a Methodist circuit rider. As a matter of fact, the little red church, which is now on the home grounds of Andrew Jackson's old home, was built by my father. What well, uh, I can uh, uh, refresh my memory and our memories, uh, since this is going to be a part of the Living Legend Library that will go into the library at Oklahoma Christian College. What's a Methodist a circuit rider? I suppose if there's a long story, but there should be a, some sort of a summary on that. Well, he is an individual who uh, who has has more than just one church. Uh -huh. uh, nominally, these are little churches, uh, uh, not any one of which would be able to support a full-time minister, and he would have from two to three. And uh, in those days, he went uh, by horseback or in a buggy from the... the one of these to another. Uh -huh. Then after that, he was pastor of a church in Nashville, and it was from Nashville that we came out here in 1910, mm -hmm. out, out in the heart of the Shine or Apaho country at the town of Weatherford, where he was a pastor. We were there a couple of years and then went out to the Panhandle, living in the town of Guyman, At that time, he was the presiding elder, as they called them in those days. Now they refer to them as district superintendents, which is a rather long and cumbersome title. <laughs> and he had almost all of what is now northwest Oklahoma, uh, a, uh, a very large part of the country that would be north of U.S. 66 and west of U.S. 81. He would be away from home sometimes 30 to 60 days at a time, going around holding quarterly meetings and whatnot. He must have been a rather hardy guy, wasn't he? He was. He came from that old Scottish uh, mountain stock in the hills of Tennessee, and uh, he always did have always did have good physical health. Uh, but he was 89 at the time that he died. But I can recall an incident when I thought I was big and strong and quite grown up, and I challenged him to a wrestling match, and he piled me so quickly I didn't know what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you spent uh, quite a few years up in that, uh, well, that's pretty rough country up through that there. That was rough country, and it's very fine country, and a very fine people out there. You have to be just a little bit, little bit tougher than the elements to survive that. I have been through there frequently, but uh, naturally haven't spent any appreciable time there. But it's even pretty obvious in these days that uh, uh, not only are the people uh, hardy and hardworking, but their their lineage and their ancestry was uh, brought all that about too. 
That certainly is true. I think that if there is one sector of Oklahoma that still more or less clearly represents the early days, the the old ideas of enterprise and and all of that, including including that of helping helping one's neighbor, mm -hmm. that it exists in Northwest Oklahoma, because life is still not too easy. You have some the rather bitter extremes of cold, and you have some extremes of heat. You have recurrent droughts, and it's a, it is a place where uh, you have to have a considerable amount of courage to stake it out. Those who did seem to have been reasonably well rewarded, many of them. That's more or less long-distance neighborliness out through that section, isn't it? That's quite true. The, uh, there are not so many towns, and they are they are somewhat uh, somewhat widely dispersed. Large holdings of land. That your neighbor may be ten or fifteen miles away. Your nearest neighbor. Was it a lonely life for you out there? No, you it wasn't lonely. We always had many things to do. In summertime, I worked out on a farm, or or uh, uh, there did something like that. One summer, I recall, I lived in one of those old. Half dugouts, half above ground, half underground. Uh -huh. uh, that was out near the town of Goodwill. I worked out there all summer on a farm owned by a man named Reed, just a young kid, about 10 years old, mm -hmm. and spent that whole summer out there cultivating maize and broom corn. Fixed up a seat on what was supposed to be a walking cultivator. I sat uh, up there on a board and on a sack full of straw. Mm -hmm. Went up and down those half mile rows all day long. You talked about those uh, uh, dugout type of uh, uh, places to live. Was that primarily to ward off the weather? Yes, and it was due largely to the high cost of lumber and the absence of enough lumber. It was easier to uh, uh, there to more or less go underground for some of it uh, there than to erect what. Uh, what we now think is just an ordinary building. Up there, the kitchen, the dining room, and perhaps uh, 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 some sort of bedroom mm -hmm. would be down there, and then the other bedrooms upstairs. Uh, what was called upstairs, but it'd just be <laughs> just one floor above ground level. More or less ground level, then. That's right. But with a sod roof. With a sod roof? A sod roof. It would be green in the summer. It was, it was that much of it. Well, that was really living native then, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I can remember there is an incident that happened the summer I worked for Mr. Reed. That he had some cattle, just mixed up cattle, a few dairy cattle, a few beef cattle, that is beef type. And uh, after all, this was a long time ago, but I can remember there that he bought a young Holstein bull in order to to uh, make an attempt to uh, to improve improve his dairy cattle, he bought this young bull, went into town and brought it out there in a wagon. It was in a big wood crate, mm -hmm. and uh, there must have been at least fifty people come around there the day that the word got out that this bull was arriving. They wanted to see what a purebred bull looked like. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was just another calf, something I had to feed, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was my first experience at learning a little bit about uh, anything of that nature, improving livestock, and that uh, uh, that all of them uh, did not have to be scrubs or didn't have to look like those we had. <laughs> How long did you stay out there, Roy? I was there all that summer. Uh, and then there was another summer there at Gaiman when uh, I, was, uh, I felt like I was a big man indeed. I herded cattle. I was I was about well I was I was only I was only eleven years old that autumn. But all that summer I would go around town. Everyone in those days in these small towns had two or three milk cows of their own. Mm -hmm. and I would go around go around town and collect these cows and take them outside of town, uh, out there on some land. It was an unfenced uh, unfenced section of state school land. And I'd take them out there and stay out there with them all day. In the evening, I'd drive them back to town, and they'd drop off uh, uh, at their respective homes. They knew them just as well as I did. <laughs> I think I think I made about 
twelve dollars net that summer. That's pretty good money in those that days. That was good money. Four dollars a month, and I had all of it at the end of the summer. <laughs> How long did you live out there? We were out at Guyman three years and went from there to Custer City where he had another pastor at then and from there to Ardmore where again he was a presiding elder and then from there to Walters. In those days they moved Methodist uh, uh, ministers around rather frequently. And we went from there to Weatherford again which was the second time I'd lived there and I haven't been, uh, I haven't been home much there since then. And uh, when, I've been when in did school or away. City? I came to Oklahoma City first in 1934, briefly, out at the Oklahoma State Fair. And then I went to, then from here to Blackwell on a paper uh, after a short stint at Seminole uh, uh, on another paper. Then I went to Blackwell, and then I came back down here mm -hmm. in uh, 1936. I was out at the State Fair a year, then I went with the Vocational Agriculture Department out of Stillwater until 1940 and came on the Oklahoma staff in 1940. Well, apparently you've always had a penchant for uh, expressing yourself, writing. Yes, I, uh, all the way through school, I did pretty well in English, particularly in uh, the, uh, uh, the theme writing category and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. Like everyone else, I did well in anything I liked and very poorly in what I didn't like. <laughs> in other words, you're just as human as anyone. That's <laughs> obviously. What did you start doing here at the uh, Oklahoma and Times? When I uh, first came down here, I was the assistant Sunday editor. I worked only on the uh, on the Sunday uh, Sunday feature section. In those days, we had a large size section, uh, the same size as the rest of the paper. And then after that, I was a general assignment reporter, city editor of the Oklahoman, a Washington correspondent, and uh, uh, for the last few years, I've been an editorial writer and columnist on the paper. Well, you spent quite a bit of time in Washington, then. Yes, yeah, several years. At one hitch and several other, uh, uh, one month to six weeks or two months duration. Well, I suspect that uh, in any newspaper man's... Uh, uh, mental repertoire uh, you've had a lot of experiences particularly since we're applying most of this uh, conversation to Oklahoma City and its environs well this is true there of course when I lived out in the state it was always a big treat to come to Oklahoma City I can remember those early times riding in here on the Rock Island and uh, uh, they're seeing the big city and going up to the top of the Concord building, which was its only uh, so-called skyscraper then, 12 stories tall, but that was a big treat to ride the elevator to the top of that building. I can imagine. And uh, there to see the big dray wagons with their big teams on the street, that was something we could understand. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Rock Island, wasn't that uh, right down the middle of Main Street? Uh, or uh, Couch, was it? it Yes, that's right. They're what we now what we now call Couch Drive. Mm -hmm. The uh, Rock Island Station was right in there where the Skirvin Hotel's uh, Sun Suite is now, swimming pool. Mm -hmm. The station was right in that opening in there. From our experiences in talking with the various people uh, with whom we're making recordings for the library at uh, the college, they must. Uh, the people around here must have been a real industrious group and a rather hardy bunch of people. Yes, they were, I'm sure. They came from all sorts of places, from many, many different sorts of backgrounds. Many of them, I think, uh, uh, or at least a majority of them, came from the southern states. Uh, a lot of that was the result of the war, that is, the Civil War. And uh, uh, there, that accounts for the fact that we've always uh, always had more or less of a southern atmosphere here. Uh, it is a little bit mystifying. Uh, there, in a sense, sometimes we say that we belong to the Midwest, sometimes to the Southwest, and mm -hmm. and that we are that we are uh, very much uh, very much southern in in sympathy. And I think this even confuses the government. We are we are classed uh, uh, as the South 
as the west, south, central portion of the United States, I believe the terminology is. You make anything of that? Well, uh, like uh, many bureaucratic statements, it's very difficult to decipher them. What, uh, you can make it read uh, just any way you want to. You can <laughs> claim all of them, west, south, and central. But there have been some very interesting individuals around here. It's been my pleasure to know some of them. I roved around the state uh, there for a number of years. I got to know quite a few of the individuals, many of whom unfortunately are now gone, including some around Oklahoma City who were here in the early days or who had a little bit of a hand in its development. I've heard all sorts of stories, many of which uh, uh, that would need uh, would need a certain amount of verification because, as everyone knows, stories improve in the telling. Oh, they do. They become embellished uh, great, greatly <laughs> as they go along. Uh, we've had uh, discussions with people about the, the lighter side and the nicer side and the progressive side of our city and so forth. And I don't suppose it's nice to bring up any seamy side, but then there's always a part of history. Was it as rough around the city in those early days as uh, some people may suggest or writings may suggest or communication? Yes, I think that it was. Uh, uh, one has to remember that this was raw and crude out here. This, uh, you had a, this tremendous influx of people all at once, and naturally you had all types of them, the good, the bad, the, the grifters, the hustlers. The honest people, you had them all. And uh, uh, as is the case with any sort of a frontier, uh, uh, there was not a whole lot of formal law in the beginning. So uh, uh, with, with, the, with the exception of, uh, of um, There, the fact that they didn't have a whole lot of lynching, they had almost everything else that goes along with, with any sort of situation like that, more or less of a raw frontier. But many people had uh, the, uh, there's something here, a uh, 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 little town lot, there's some good or a water well that they had to defend with their own gun in order to keep it. If someone else could get it away, they did. And, of course, there were innumerable lawsuits because everything was hastily done. Lines were, uh, lines were drawn improperly in many instances, and there were often uh, uh, there are cases of two, uh, two almost legitimate claimants to one piece of property. And uh, uh, there, this, there, this was a lawyer's heyday for a while. We talked the other day with uh, uh, Morris Lowenstein, or Lowenstein, who, uh, as uh, he remarked, they are in business, one of the few places that are still in business in the same spot that uh, they settled in many, many, many years ago. Yes, that was in the, that was in the heart of the early part of town, right yeah, yeah. down where the two town sites failed to join owing to opposition between the two town site companies. That's the reason for the little jogs that you have on what we used to call Grand Avenue. Uh, Where, here on Broadway? They're now called Sheridan, yes. Sheridan, Sheridan and, and Broadway, Sheridan. Robinson and Sheridan, uh -huh. all of those down there. And also, if you stand down there in the middle of, uh, of uh, the Main Street and look west, you'll see a slight bend down on the western end of Main Street. That, too, was a part of the argument. But the two rival, uh, two rival town site companies each of whom had a plat. The plats didn't match, and neither one would give up. So that's why we have those, all of those uh, little elbows in there in the crooked streets. You mean that they were private companies? That private companies that, that came in here and laid out town, town sites. Uh -huh. And then eventually they were taken over by the Metropolitan right. Fund. By the city. Mm -hmm. the, uh, at that time, uh, the Canadian River was not where it is at the present. Uh, well, it was uh, it was not exactly where it is now because it did change its course. In fact, it used used to do that uh, with a certain amount of regularity. They have had some enormous floods that got all over all over the south end of town, up to as far up to as far as our present Main Street. 
and they're particularly out uh, out around where the old streetcar barns used to be out on Exchange Avenue. Uh, Mr. Lowenstein mentioned the uh, uh, the old Del Mar Garden. That was out yes, there. that was one of the early recreational places. Do you recall that in town? Well, no, that was gone. Uh, there, there still were some others around here. Uh, there for a number of years, like the old Boga Ballroom. That, uh, uh, that was that was over here on Fifth Street, at, and that was the first home of Mistletoe Express. What uh, had been the old ballroom? There was a discussion about uh, what used to be out at Bell Isle. Now that was at uh, the end of uh, well, it's still Class and Boulevard. Yeah, that was the, that was the end of the Class and Streetcar line. Also, you could ride out. Uh, out there on a car, they had uh, that was a very nice place. You could rent a, a, a little wood boat and go around uh, on the little lake, strumming a ukulele, well, singing was, to your lady. It was a natural life. body of water then. Wasn't it? Yes, uh huh. It was a man made lake uh, uh, that, that was created by little creek about the Deep Fork Creek. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the source of the water for it. Well, and then later bigger? on, it was taken over by OG&E, and, e and uh, uh -huh. all the entertainment features were knocked down. For years, they still retained the pavilion out there. They used to have company employee picnics there, and they let other organizations in town use it. Uh -huh. Wasn't that lake a little bigger than it is now? Mm, I think it was, yes. Mm -hmm. Encroaching civilization, filling up lots, building <laughs> houses, all that. <laughs> yeah. Up there, narrowing down the watershed and whatever. Uh -huh. The downtown area must have been interesting in its involvement from muddy lanes and everything. As you say, the coal court building was the largest and one of the first buildings, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. The Huckins Hotel was, was there. The Skirvin, there was a built just a few years after the Huckins. There have been a lot of interesting things about the Huckins Hotel. There was one point in Oklahoma's history where it was the state capital for 30 days after the removal to Oklahoma City from Guthrie. Wasn't that following the removal of the seal or the bringing right. of the seal from Guthrie into Oklahoma into City? Into Oklahoma City. By the first first governor, wasn't it? By no, it was not the first governor. I can't recall his name now. I've read the history, but it's uh, sketchy in my mind. Uh matter of fact, it was, uh, uh, I got it out of the, uh, the book that Irvin Hurst wrote about the, mm -hmm. the state. It's an interesting book. The 46th State, the name of the book. Mm -hmm. There was a flag that was used over the Huckins Hotel during that interim period where it was, when it act actually was the seat of government of Oklahoma, that uh, uh, did not have that many stars in it. It happened only to have 45 stars. It was a large flag owned by a couple who were then living in the hotel. And in, in 1952, I happened to run into uh, run into their daughter uh, up in Maryland, and she had this old flag of uh, with its. Uh, uh, one star short that had uh -huh. flown over the hotel. She gave it to me, and I brought it back down here, and it's now at the State Historical Society. <laughs> Governor Haskell. Haskell, right. I would remember the name, mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, there's still a controversy about whether the uh, seal was stolen or whether it was legitimate. Well, actually, it was not stolen. It was brought down here just more or less as a stunt by W.B. Anthony, Big Bill Anthony. And there's a little bit of a sidelight on that. We had a excellent editorial writer around here for many years named Luther Harrison, quite an interesting individual. Luther happened to be down at the Huckins Hotel one evening, just uh, uh, there around the lobby because he uh, he could pick up all sorts of political things there. That uh, uh, that certainly was the hotbed of political discussion. There, Mr. Anthony came by and said, "Why don't you go with me for uh, uh, for a uh, little ride?" So Luther had nothing else to do, and he went with him. That happened to be the ride up to Guthrie, where Anthony got the seal and brought it back down here. A real wonderful eyewitness account. Huh? Yes, <laughs> it was not stolen in the sense that no. uh, 
uh, that they've said all of this time. The, the Secretary of State handed it to Anthony. He brought it down here. But, of course, there was a lot of dissension right at that time uh, over the fact that the Capitol was removed. And also, there's, uh, there's something in that connection that a lot of people don't know. But that was not the only election held. That was the second election. The first election was held between Guthrie, Shawnee, and Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. And there was some dissension uh, there over that. Uh, there are some claims about improper ballots and uh, improper petitions. And all of that, so uh, 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 a, uh, uh, this other election was held, and there, because uh, because the city of Shawnee had come out third in the previous one, uh, this involved only Oklahoma City and Guthrie, and the people voted to move it to Oklahoma City. So it actually was done legally, although there uh, was considerable. Uh, uh, oh, sort of an air of adventure about this seal bet. There always has to be a pro and a con about a story. That's right. <laughs> well, historically, it's recorded as a legitimate move, but then right. there are still those who, uh, or at least some of the uh, uh, ancestors of the people who were present at that time, still like to uh, build it up into quite a story. Yeah. I think Anthony was later city manager at Walters, if my memory is correct. Mm-hmm. Well, the Huckins must have been quite a hist, or rather, is quite a historical hostelry, isn't it? Yes, it isn't any longer the political capital, but it uh, certainly was for a long time. Well, it also was the seat uh, uh, of action in the so-called. Uh, so-called U-Lamb Rebellion under the Johnson administration. That's where the rump sessions of the legislature were held. In the hotel? In the hotel. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to use the Capitol, so they moved to the Huckins. (laughs) Well, as you say, born and bred of... uh, of, uh, almost necessity and being practically an instant city as a result of the uh, the run and uh, growing uh, almost like topsy. Many things happened that were uh, not planned and probably some are still happening that are not planned. That's like true. Sometimes they call it the folly of youth. But this state did uh, foster some colorful characters and they were perhaps more colorful by the dissertations about them if you were living outside the state. Yes. We always, uh, we had a large number of outside writers in here. Uh, 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 at the time of the run and subsequent to that, and I'm afraid they let their imaginations run a little wild with them sometimes, but then... Uh, it was exciting. It was interesting. There was an impression about the state that uh, was perhaps not entirely true. But uh, then that's, that has always been true. People note the extraordinary or uh, like the semi-sensational a little bit more than the sober, industrious part of it. It always seemed, uh, not being a native of Oklahoma and uh, being a fair student of history and particularly uh, current history as it happened at the time in the news business and so forth, that the political uh, atmosphere in Oklahoma was never static. No, just like the thing that we use every year at the gridiron, just breathe this bit of aroma. Something always happens in Oklahoma. (laughs) It always does. There have been some very interesting things happen, but the situation is never static. That's for sure. I suspect that you were closely involved in one way or another in some of those events. Can you recall any that are of particular interest that caused a great deal of excitement one way or another? I'm afraid I can't make any sort of claim to anything like that. I have been an observer of a lot of it. Well, that's more or, or less what I It's a little difficult to try to just snatch something out of the air that... I hit you rather cold, unusual. though. Uh, 
there is, uh, despite all of the uh, the uproar and so forth that have accompanied the various steps of progress, do you think that we have done it on a fairly uh, good footing, some of the progress that we have made? Aligning is strictly to the city. In other words, our planning. Well, of course, you can always use hindsight and and uh, say that something should have been done a different way, and there have been some obvious mistakes uh, that we can see now that things should have been done a little bit differently. But on the other hand, there were so many things there that were done with an admirable foresight. Uh, I refer particularly to the city's park system. Uh, at the time that that land was acquired and everything... Um, there, that was all planned. They called the man who did it more or less a visionary and a fool, but he managed to talk, uh, talk the city into uh, uh, getting this land for all the parks, that is, all of the major parks. And uh, there also for the Beltline Road around the city that we know, uh, that we know now at Grand Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, all of that, all of this very large amount of right-of-way for this encircling belt, and uh, therefore all of the basic park lands, Lincoln Park's land out there, Trosper and all of the other older parks, both uh, 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 that were on the edge of the city once and those that are uh, uh, there that are inside the city now, all of that costs slightly more than $100,000. And uh, you could go out there now and sell off 80 acres or less, actually, uh, uh, of that amount off Lincoln Park for more than the whole system cost. Who was that was a large amount of foresight. His name was Clark. I don't remember his first name. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had to argue uh, with everyone for a long time. There were other things like, uh, like there, for instance, uh, the, the actions that were done by uh, the organization that was to argue uh, with everyone for a long time. There were other things like, uh, like there, for instance, uh, the, the actions that were done by uh, the organization that was the, the predecessor of the Chamber of Commerce and locating the original, original packing plant here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there again uh, was some admirable foresight. There, there had been an attempt to locate a packing plant down at Chickasha because it was directly on a north-south railroad, and uh, 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 there, for some reason, uh, uh, some of the people down there did not uh, uh, did not want to do anything toward the toward the uh, there's some land, getting the land and giving it giving it to some packing plant as an inducement to come in. But that was done here, and as a result, we had we had two major plants for many years. We now have one of those, uh, one of the nation's largest and most modern plants as a survivor of that, and then a uh, uh, some half a dozen very good other plants, uh, and a an excellent uh, excellent livestock market. That was the reason for it, not just the acquisition of the packing plant itself, uh, although. Uh, uh, it had a large number of employees, but to but to make this a much better much better livestock market, and it is right today. This is the largest feeder stocker market in the United States uh, mm. okay, for that type of cattle, and it's a very very good market for all types of slaughter cattle, and it is a a uh, very large asset to the city. But that was an example of a little bit of foresight because. Uh, Oklahoma City uh, it was not located too well for north, south, east, west railroad traffic. Mm -hmm. Who was this man Clark? I don't know. Uh, uh, what position I have, did he hold? I, I have just heard his name and I've heard that incident about the, uh -huh. uh, how he argued for this idea and managed to put it across. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gaylord could, could tell you, he remembered it. There seems to be quite a few of those, uh, as you say, foresighted people back in those days. But despite all opposition, they they had uh, their vision was rather clear. Now, I recall 
when I first came to Oklahoma City, which is really of no consequence except this observation. I was trying to figure out what this Grand Boulevard was one day and what it was going to do. As a matter of fact, I drove it just to find out mm -hmm. where does this thing go because every once in a while you cross it, you'd run into Grand Boulevard again. And uh, in great measure, it still is an unimproved uh, uh, roadway. Yes, but it has been improved in a number number yeah. of places, as you know, and this uh, uh, there the section over on the west side of town is to be used for uh, for. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has already been programmed uh, there for a west bypass, mm -hmm. uh, the limited access road. So it fits into the present plans. Yes, that's right. That was that was looking ahead to uh, some actions that would be taken by the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads. 50 years later when they insist on a belt line around towns. Mm -hmm. But he had the idea then. Mm. It was a fantastic idea because, uh, and until you get the story or the uh, some indication as to what that particular individual had in mind, you still get. It's rather difficult to figure out, particularly to a stranger. There's another thing uh, uh, that... Uh, that this suggests to me in relation there to roads, how Oklahoma City got to be on U.S. 66, which is, has always been called the Main Street of America, running from Chicago to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It could have gone on several alternative routes, uh, but there were some individuals here who uh, uh, they were quite anxious that the road come through Oklahoma City. And uh, after it had been more or less located and surveyed down this direction, or at least down the, down as far as Joplin, Missouri, there these people got in an old Ford touring car, a Model T, and drove all the way to the West Coast and just about laid out what later became the future or uh, uh, the uh, uh, the future U.S. 66, or at the or at least uh, there the route. Uh -huh. They were the late R.A. Singletary of Oklahoma City, Joe Morse of Oklahoma City, and Charlie Tompkins of El Reno. They made all of that. They had many experiences with no roads or just uh, uh, there are some very dim trails and uh, long stretches without gasoline or water or food and uh -huh. everything like that. They camped out, and uh, uh, they, but the route that they picked... Uh, Rather, the route that they selected is just about the modern route of U.S. 66. And they proved that it was the most feasible one. At least they proved it to the satisfaction uh, of uh, everyone concerned, and the highway was routed through Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of pluses like that, haven't we? Uh, and you can't always call it luck. No, it, it wasn't, wasn't always luck. luck. Not by any means. Well, we have a lot to look forward to. Uh, from all the plans that uh, have been revealed and the encouragement that people have and the obvious drive that there still seems that still seems to permeate the activities of the city and the possibility perhaps of even it's having, still young. It's still a young city. It's still lusty, as you say. It has has a lot of drive. It hasn't. It's not slowing down at all. Mm -hmm. The feeling that uh, some of the uh, people who have been here a long, long time have that, uh, even though that they may not uh, or they won't, as a matter of fact, be around in a few years, uh, they think we're just on the threshold. Well, I think that that is correct. I think that the city will go ahead. And uh, while we've had some outstanding leadership in the past, I don't think that we've run out of that either because I think uh, that there's a certain a certain amount of inheritable characteristics to, uh, to this, uh, oh, the area, to the... Uh, whole idea of what you might call the spirit of the city, if that is inheritable, but uh, I think that it is, and I don't see there really any end to it. I think that, that it will continue. 
one of the most enthusiastic persons that uh, I've met among many in the course of making these recording, uh, recordings is uh, uh, Miss Lottie Shepherd, the Shepherd sister, who during the during the uh, talk with her, uh, I asked her how she felt when uh, they uh, turned over their land, and now most of it is uh, Shepherd Mall, which is a huge shopping center, air conditioned throughout, and everything else completely modern. I said, how did you feel when you saw those bulldozers tearing up that property? It's amazing. She said they had the most wonderful time, practically one of the most wonderful times in their lives, watching. Because everything she said, every shovel of dirt, meant that something was going forward. Well, that's a very interesting reaction, and there is an outstanding example of, uh, uh, if you like, of what uh, has happened around Oklahoma City, because it has not been many years ago. Certainly, certainly it is within my memory. Uh, there, when the Shepherd Farm was outside Oklahoma City, it was uh, they really considered out in the country. There was a lake there, large enough for people to get out out on in a boat there to fish. They'd go out there for Sunday picnics and all that sort of thing. That was before they had housing all over that end of town. Uh, there in storm sewers and everything else, there was a considerable drainage area. Uh, as a matter of fact, even now, sometimes you've seen a pretty good flood of water come down Villa heading north. Uh, but this was an attractive, uh, a, a, a very nice place, an attractive place to go on a Sunday, uh, there for a drive to go out there and sit around a picnic table and all that sort of thing. I've heard many tales of that. I can remember seeing it. I never did do that myself because it had already begun to shrivel a little bit by the time I moved here, but I, I've heard many tales about it. Uh, there I recall the late Ralph Hempel, who for many years was manager at Oklahoma State Fair, talk about going out there on a drive. Uh, there he lived on the east side of town. And uh, that this was, this was considered a, uh, a nice long drive for them to go out there for a family outing out to Shepherd Lane. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember Clyde Shepherd sitting out there with about a half dozen calves. Uh, uh, he'd go out the yards and buy a half a dozen young calves and put them out there, uh, uh, there and sit out there and watch them eat the grass. <laughs> there and ultimately he'd take them back down to the yards and sell them but you'd think from the way he talked and the way he watched the market just exactly when to buy or sell according to his own satisfaction that he had a thousand head of <laughs> but he had a lot of fun <laughs> the uh, state fair has had uh, quite a history and has made quite a contribution to uh, the o Oklahoma City as well as to the state it certainly has, has. It actually a little older than the state because they had the first fair in September 1907 and Oklahoma became a state in November 1907. It was organized by a number of people around here, including Ed and Henry Overholzer, uh, Oscar Dietz, who was, uh, uh, who was in the wholesale grocery business here, lived and died a bachelor, Floyd Lamb, who was a son-in-law of W.J. Petty, the man who put in the first hardware store in Oklahoma City, and uh, uh, oh, uh, C.G. Jones, who was really a terrific promoter of various activities around here, and a number of other people. But they organized the Oklahoma State Fair Association as a uh, uh, nonprofit organization and uh, uh, managed to get hold of 160 acres of land on the east side of town. C.G. Jones went up to St. Louis and fast talk to Fisco into building a little railroad out there, a spur line, so, uh, so that they can move in livestock and other things, because almost everything in those days, uh, uh, they're moved by rail. That was before we had decent roads and a, a large-scale trucking industry. And it started out and uh, had been going ever since. And today, as you know, we have one of the largest and best state fair plants in the nation. It has been moved. It's been rebuilt. It is owned by Oklahoma City. There's somewhat of a misnomer in that title because it does not get any money from the state. Uh -huh. But uh, it is it is still a going concern. Larger attendance and everything else every year. 
I had an interesting sidelight in, in a discussion with Mr. L.A. Macklinburg uh, before he got into the, the business that he built into such a, uh, a fine firm. He said that he used to sell advertising on the fences out at the state fair. <laughs> Uh, which must have been an exciting time for him. <laughs> yeah. Although practically everything in which he was engaged uh, must have been exciting, because he's that type of man. Yes. Uh, he, is, uh, he has enjoyed a very rich life, very full life. When did the State Fair move to its present location, right? It was after, after War II, I believe, 48. Mm -hmm. I may be a little bit off one way or another there. But it was after the war and it came about as a combination deal. They needed more space there for schools uh, on the east side and uh, uh, the uh, section of land that it moved to was state school land so this was a deal whereby the Oklahoma City Board of Education traded uh, uh, that they got possession of, uh, of that section of school land and then they traded it to the city of Oklahoma City uh, for the old site mm -hmm. and the old buildings out at the uh, at the old grounds, and uh, 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 used some of the structures and built a modern high school out there, Douglas High School, uh, that was built there. Mm -hmm. up there the, uh, back sometime in the past, the city acquired title to the land at the old ground it was known then uh, it was it was included in the city park system it was a part of the city park system well apparently they made a good deal because they got a fine piece of ground and uh, still they can expand out there can, can expand and add more activities out there and make it uh, make it quite a center as you know there are other things out there now the art center the uh, science and art museum planetarium other activities like that that give it uh, give it much more year-round use. But as a matter of fact, many of the buildings that that are out there are used rather constantly all year for various types of meetings and this sort of thing. It isn't used only this uh, during uh, during the annual fair. What makes which makes it more of a functional activity rather That's than right. just static until such time as there is a fair. Uh, and we the. Uh, uh, talk with people and strangers who come into town and either during the fair or at off times or for some other event that's taking place at the fair. And they have all, bar none, expressed the uh, delight at even just the uh, architecture that was used in the building. That's right. You know who was responsible for that? Or was it a grouping? It was more more or less of a consensus. There were there was more than one architect involved in it. Uh, certain architectural firms did certain buildings, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there also was a considerable amount of planning uh, uh, done out there to make it uh, a little, mo little more highly functional. And uh, but that has been the rule there since, so that you get uh, so that you get more use of different buildings, and that they are adaptable for more things. And uh, so that certain activi activities can more or less uh, more or less be grouped together. How are you, sir? Just a few minutes. You got work for him? <laughs> oh, all right. Be about five minutes. How's that? Oh. <coughs> uh, Anything else, Roy, that you can recall, or is there any items uh, there you'd is, like uh, to bring out? Right along in that same line about use of the buildings out there, as you know, we've got a state 4-H and FFA junior livestock show we hold here each March. Mm -hmm. That is held out, the, out at the fairgrounds, and uh, this is the largest strictly junior livestock show in the United States from a standpoint of entries. And... Uh, uh, as you know, a large part of the large part of the junior shows around the country are, are always held in connection with an open show, uh, like at Kansas City or Chicago mm -hmm. or Fort Worth. Right. And uh, uh, they're always they are more or less overshadowed uh, uh, by the open show. And uh, 
that by having this at a separate time of the year, uh, it has been built up into a terrific show. It's an excellent show. It's a constant source of attraction for people at the state fairgrounds, even yes. when there's nothing there, uh, despite uh, the interest there is in the Art Center and the Science and Arts Foundation. Yes, they've even had attractions out there like Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> even go into <laughs> politics on occasion. Roy, I think we should touch uh, a little bit before we uh, leave on the uh, uh, Western Heritage Foundation and the Cowboy Hall of Fame that finally, in this year of 1965, is coming into fruition. Yes, this is a long, long dream. It's a 10-year effort that is at last going to be culminated. I have always been quite interested in that. I did have a minor part in a little bit of that. I was happened to be a member of the committee that went out to Denver and made a pitch to the to the site selection committee, uh, therefore location of that here, and we were we were successful in getting it located here, and I've been uh, rather closely associated with it ever since. I'm highly in sympathy with the idealism back of it. I knew C.A. Reynolds quite well, the man who had the original concept. His idea was to honor everyone, or honor at least those uh, individuals who made an outstanding contribution to the development of the American West. And uh, I think it's a splendid idea because I think no era in our history has as much color and glamour as the era of Western expansion. And it had good, strong people in it. And uh, uh, it was because of those people and those, those who carried on many aspects of uh, what we like to call the Western American tradition uh, that this, this whole, the whole, whole country was developed. And uh, there the name cowboy was put in it because they actually, uh, uh, during that time, during, during, the, during the main period of expansion, it was the horse that took man every place, whether he rode him or whether he had him hooked to a buggy or a wagon. Uh -huh. uh, but the cowboy himself, uh, uh, there became an international symbol of the American West. And uh, uh, you can go any place in the world and you find that the American cowboy prototype is a very popular person. And you know how long Western movies, Western music, anything Western has held on longer than anything else in our whole system of folklore. So there is a tremendous appeal in it. Uh, that Mr. Reynolds' idea was not just uh, 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 the ordinary cowboy who might go out and uh, might go out and put his brand on somebody else's uh, young calf, but uh, they're on the people who started out with the horse, who uh, uh, who uh, uh, they went on to, uh, then to become ranchers, to become members of legislatures and territorial governors, and help create states and do everything else because this was essentially a ranching country mm -hmm. all uh, uh, all over the west there from the Dakotas to the border and uh, uh, there were some other influences out in the Pacific Northwest and a certain amount in some of the mountain states uh, out there mining lumbering that sort of thing but it was essentially the man on horseback that opened and developed the west he came after the trapper and after the man on horseback came the other aspect of civilization. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be a magnificent thing. It? it certainly is. I'd be very glad to see it opened up. Roy, thank you very much for taking your time for your reflection and recalling some of the things I realize that we perhaps caught you off guard on some and rather cold, but uh, we think that whatever is said by the many people who have had at least a, a minute part in the history of Oklahoma City deserves to be in the library, and I know the college thanks you very much. Well, I am, I am very highly appreciative of having had sort of a side row seat at a lot of the development around here. It's a most interesting place, and I would rather live here than any place that I've been, and as you know, I've been to quite a few because it is so interesting, because it's so alive and so viral, and because it's still going. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy.
Thank you, Ryan. 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 